It's our pleasure to welcome Dr. Gerstner again at this hour. Those of you who were here at the previous hour and have stayed did so on purpose, of course, because you wanted to hear another word from the uh, Word of God that would comfort and challenge and instruct us. We hope that you're also planning to be with us this afternoon as the topics for this afternoon are matters of great controversy in the church, and you would do well to be informed about them and to hear things that you're like, not likely to hear everywhere you'll go. So we hope that you'll be planning to come, and we will be taking care of the children uh, who are too young to sit in the service as best we can. Dr. Gerstner, as you all recognize, is a renowned scholar and all that sort of thing, and I don't mean to discount that at all. He's working on some uh, theology, uh, theology in three volumes of Jonathan Edwards, uh, many other publications to his credit, but you have come to hear his preaching, and we're glad that you've come, and we're glad that God has given him to the church, and we welcome him now to ask the church. Thank you, Pastor Graham. I'd like to be with you, good friends of Ashwith, uh, once again. And as the pastor has indicated, I'm giving a series of loosely connected, but connected, on um, four sermon lectures, the last hour on the flesh and the Holy Spirit, in which I try to indicate that the apostle was teaching us that once the Holy Spirit has taken up residence in our souls, he will never let us go back to the self, the flesh, the corruption, which in our natures, fallen, we actually are. Now, in this hour, we consider assurance which asks the question whether the Holy Spirit has indeed taken up his residence in our soul, and if so, that doctrine maintains that he will abide there uh, forever. This afternoon, we'll be talking about the external gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, from the first chapter, first book of Corinthians, chapter 12, and as we continue it through 13 and 14 in the second lecture, the fact that those external gifts, unlike the internal gift of love, have ceased, whereas the love, which is the Holy Spirit, abides uh, forever. The text as a basis for our study of assurance in a few moments. I want to thank the pastor for allowing this professor to use a blackboard for this uh, series of four and apologize to the uh, choir especially because they're totally left out of that. And also to those of you who can't see what I'm saying, it doesn't matter. You can hear what I'm saying, but it'll help you to understand what you're hearing if you can uh, see the outline as well. So I'm taking advantage of uh, that when we present the lecture to use that blackboard this morning and again this afternoon. The text is from John chapter 10, verse 21 through 30. John 10, 22, excuse me, through 30. It was the feast of the dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered round him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness to me, but you do not believe, because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. 
As I mentioned, the doctrine at this hour is assurance of salvation, and the first thing, of course, is to understand the meaning of that doctrine. It has two elements in it. One, that you are conscious of the fact that you are a saved soul in living communion with Jesus Christ, whose spirit dwells in you, and the second part, that you will ever be the same, that that spirit will never cease to reside uh, in you. That's the doctrine of assurance of salvation, which the Reformed churches such as yours teach, because we believe the Bible not only teaches it, but emphatically does. However, the first observation I have to make is that what is known historically as Arminianism, some of you know it, that name and some don't know, but you all know the name evangelical, and today most people who go by evangelicals are not like Tom Graham and John Gerstner, truly Reformed theologians, but they are Arminian theologians, and the bearing of that fact on this doctrine is that most modern evangelical preachers, teachers, and believers actually uh, take this view, that they can know and say, I have salvation, but they still have to face the question on their understanding, or I would say misunderstanding, of the Bible, Will I keep it? Can I keep it? They believe the Bible teaches that though they have it, they may lose it. And the great question for them, therefore, may not be, do I have it? I have met many evangelicals who are very confident that they have it, that they have been born again, that they are Christians. But on their principles, they cannot know that they'll have it tomorrow. They cannot know that they will die in faith. I have a friend of mine, a free will Baptist minister, who's been in classes of mine over a period of about 30 years. And ever we, ever we have any uh, private conversation, he uh, still is, I suppose. It's been about 10 years now since I've seen him, I guess. But uh, he always tells me that he is sure of salvation. I love my wife. And I'm sure I'm always going to love my wife. I love Jesus Christ, and I'm sure I'm always going to love Jesus Christ. And as I say to my friends, you cannot say that on your principle. You're stealing reform capital. Your own understanding of the Bible does not permit you to say that. And though I've given this speech at least ten times to him, I suppose, eyeball to eyeball, vehemence to vehemence. You're contradicting yourself, teaching on the one hand that a saint such as yourself can be lost forever and saying you can't be lost forever. Now, if you ever meet an evangelical Arminian who says that, remind him that he's telling a lie. Out of one fat my side of his mouth, he's saying the doctrine is that I may lose salvation. Now the other, he's saying I cannot lose it. The result is that the vast majority of professing Christians of our time conservative Christians, I mean fundamentalist Christians, evangelical Christians, who do believe that they are saved can never, on their principles, without violating what they think to be the teaching of the Word of God, have assurance of salvation. Because though they may hope they will have Christ forever in their heart, according to their own principles, they cannot be sure of it. Now their question is... Well, I keep it. Now, the question, uh, I, I make this observation, I'll just briefly, uh, very briefly mention it passing. Really, far from keeping salvation, one cannot get it even on Arminian uh, doctrine. Uh, let me just try to explain this very briefly uh, here. According to Arminian doctrine, according to the vast majority of evangelical teaching today, you must be born again. But, you are born again by, first of all, believing. Believe, and you'll be born again. That's the teaching of Arminian evangelicalism, which was the overwhelming majority. The teaching of the Bible is, you're born again, and then you believe. Unless a person is born again, he can't even see the kingdom. Unless he's born of water and the Spirit, he can't enter the kingdom. The Arminians put the theological court before the horse, and they try to suggest that 
Faith brings the new birth when it's new birth that brings the faith. And what I mean by this second point, if they think that a sinner, such as I described last time, can initiate faith without being reborn, the faith he initiates is not genuine. It's a work of the flesh. It may be a raising of the hand, it may be a signing of a card, it may be a joining of a church, it may be jumping over a cliff, it doesn't make any difference what it is. It's a product of the flesh. It is not a product of the Holy Spirit. So they don't recognize that, so they think that they really are saved, and they may be saved, but it'll be contrary to their own principle, and that their problem is, can I keep what I now have? I'm just simply saying as a kind of aside, you can't even have it on your principles, much less keep it, but let's assume for the sake of argument that you can. Your problem is, can I keep it? What I have. Now, I'm mentioning here point number three, that biblical or Calvinistic doctrine teaches this, that you have it, and if you have it, and that if you have it, you will keep it. So the question is, do I have it? If the Calvinistic or Reformed interpretation of the Bible is sound, which is what Pastor Graham and I teach and what all the Reformed churches down through the ages have taught, and so on, if that is sound, and I of course believe it is or I wouldn't be teaching it, then the great question is, do I have it? Not can I keep it, but do I have it? Now let me explain again about this word Calvinistic. I know Tom Graham has explained it to you and I've explained it to you myself a number of times and so on. And I love to quote that statement of the great Baptist theologian C.H. Spurgeon. Calvinism is just a nickname for Christianity. That's all there is. And the Bible teaches what we call Calvinism. You say, well, why don't you just say Christianity? You know the answer to that, don't you? Because there are at least a dozen different definitions of Christianity. Some call this Christianity. Some call that Christianity. Arminianism calls that Christianity. Catholicism calls that Christianity, etc., etc., etc. So if I said Christianity, you'd say, which of the twelve or so ideas do you have in mind? Well, what I have in mind is Calvinism. That's the way it has been best described, and so on. So that's just a nickname for Christianity. But here, it's taught, whether you believe that's true or not, this particular doctrine which Tom Graham and all Reformed pastors teach, and so on, maintains that if you have it, you can never lose it. You know the old ditty, for example. If you have it, you never lose it. If you lose it, you never had it, and so on. But right now, what we're observing is, according to Reformed doctrine, which we believe is biblical doctrine, if you have it, you can't lose it. So the great question is, do I have it? The Arminian's great question is, will I keep it? Our great question is, do I have it? They are utterly uncertain about whether they'll keep it. We may be very uncertain about whether we have it. We will never be uncertain about whether we will keep it if we understand and believe Reformed doctrine. So how do we know if we have it and therefore cannot lose it? That's the great question. How do I know? If only I know that I am in Christ, then I throw my hat in the air. Then I rejoice forevermore, because as this text said, my sheep hear my voice, and no one will ever take those sheep away. If I know, if you know, that when Jesus speaks, I hear my shepherd calling me by name. If I know that, and that is true, Jesus Christ assures me, no one's ever going to take you out of my hand or my father's hand. So all I want to know is, do I hear the shepherd's voice? And is he calling my name? That's the great question. I'll have no anxiety thereafter. I'll have all the anxiety under heaven. And I say to any of you, for example, who doubt your own conversion, you ought to have incredible apprehension. It's most unfortunate that you ever sleep at all. You ought not to have any peace until you have listened and heard the shepherd's voice. But, assuming now you have all understood this doctrine and ask yourself the question, do I hear the the shepherd's voice? And then know, of course, that I'm his and his forever. So how do I know that I have it? How do I know that God has me? How do I know that I am one of Christ's sheep? 
Here I put it very briefly by introspection in the first place, and then I coined the expression by extra expression. There is no such term. Don't bother looking it up in your Webster's International. There isn't any such term as extra, extra uh, inspection. But you know inspection means looking in. And I'm just coining this expression to say looking out at your behavior. But the first question you have to ask yourself is the answer to Jesus saying to you, as he says inaudibly to Peter long ago, Lovest thou me? His sheep love him. They come to him. Nobody can woo them away from him. Do you love me? He yes. asks. That's a very personal question. My wife and I have been married for 46 years, and I can't answer that question for her, and she can't answer it for me. Jesus says to Edna Gerstner, Lovest thou me? And John Gerster can't answer the question. Edna Gerster has to answer it. He says to John Gerster, lovest thou me? And Edna Gerster can't answer the question. John has to answer it. And you have to answer it. It's a very personal question. And though Jesus Christ is not visibly present and audibly heard, he is just as truly asking everyone here, do you love me? And everyone here must answer that question for herself, for himself. A very, very private, very, very personal, very, very urgent, very, very indispensable question. And it can be answered. You might answer it honestly, I don't know. I've talked with people, incidentally, in Jesus' name, on this behalf, and I've asked them. I'm not sure. When you put it that way, I believe Jesus Christ is divine. I believe he was virgin born. I believe he came into the world to save sinners. But when you ask me in his name, do I love him? The way I love my wife or my husband or my friend or my children or my parents or someone like that, do I love him? Do I know him? That way that I could say with a Hartford theologian of long ago, I know Jesus Christ better than I know anybody in Hartford, Connecticut. I know Jesus Christ better than I know anybody in Baltimore, and I love him more deeply than I love the dearest friend on earth. Well, you better put it that way. That's the way Jesus puts it. Do you love him? And if you say, I'm not sure, you better count that as a negative. If you're not sure you love him, then you're not sure that you're one of his sheep. You may be, without knowing it, that's conceivable. But one thing is certain, you can't know it, be confident about it, unless you can honestly say, as I say very privately and for yourself alone, yes, Jesus, I love you. I'm ashamed of how little I love you. And I have to confess how often I hate you. Yes, I love you. And yes, I know what you mean by saying, I'm a good shepherd and I call my sheep. I know when your words come to me through sacred writ, they come to me as if you were standing alongside of me and all the beaming radiance of your affection was felt in my very bone. Yes, I love you, Lord Jesus. And you may ultimately say with the impatience of Simon Peter when he was asked the question for the third time, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. He said that, you remember, after he had denied Christ three times and Christ had put that question to him, lovest thou me, three times. Not only that Peter knew that he loved Jesus in spite of the terrible behavior which would have spelled out in and of itself absolute unbelief and hatred of Jesus Christ. You know I love you in spite of appearances, in spite of my behavior. On that dreadful occasion, not only do I know it, Lord, but you know it perfectly. You know everything. If I'm a fraud or a counterfeit or a liar or a hypocrite, you know it. But I know I'm not, and I know I love you, and you know it infinitely better than I do. Now, that's the first part of it. As I say, you flunk this part of the exam if you say, no, frankly, no, I don't. I come to church because my parents make me come to church. I know people who've married certain... Uh, 
uh, men, uh, 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 let's put it this way, they have stipulated that if you come to church, I'll marry you. Or if you become a Christian or something like that. So here's this man saying, no, Lord, I don't love you. I love my wife. And she makes me come to church. I don't care what it is. But just feel comfortable. Like have a place for your children in Sunday school. I don't know what it is. But if you say, I don't really love you. I make an outward gesture for this reason or the other, but when you put the question that way, do you love me? No, I don't. If you say either no or I don't know, then you're flunking the test of introspection. You've no reason. As I say, you may still be a believer in spite of your ignorance, but at the same time, you have no basis for confidence in that. But now suppose every one of you here says, in the privacy of his own soul, in answer to the intimate question of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Now comes the extrospection. You could be wrong. Just as truly as you could be wrong when you say you don't know to love him, you could be wrong when you say you do love him. This makes the matter complicated. When you're dealing with the inmost resources of the human soul, you're dealing with very deep waters. And it gets very probing and very difficult. I repeat the statement. I don't know, but, uh, even though it makes it more difficult. You can think you love him and not love him. You can think you not love him and do love him. That's your problem. I can only tell you the problem. You've got to solve it on the individual basis here. But suppose now, after an honest self-examination, internal scrutiny, introspection, you say, I love you, Lord Jesus. Then comes the question of Jesus, or the commandment, if you love me, Keep my commandments. You say you love me. Very good. There's hope for you. Because if you didn't, you wouldn't be the beneficiary of my salvation. You understand that. But if you do say you love me, that doesn't make you a lover of me. Just because you say it, that doesn't mean you mean it or understand it. If you say it, then the question is, do you act accordingly? And if you love me, you keep my commandments. This is where the extrospection comes in. Here again, I can only make a suggestion. I can't do what ought to be the main business of your souls and occupy you for a lifetime. Checking very, very carefully. Knowing what the commandments are, the Ten Commandments and any other commandments which Jesus Christ gave in his holy word, and their meaning accurately understood, whether it is being scrupulously observed by you, or whether, under pressure, you conform to this world. In order to get ahead, you make it a policy to put Christ behind. You may do as Peter did under the pressure of a certain circumstance. Deny him. It is conceivable. But if Peter had ever said, Lord, I love you, but when it costs too much to follow you, count me out. He would be a liar when he said he loved him. That he could really love Jesus Christ and yet have so much of that flesh I was talking about in the last hour left in him that he's capable of swearing, I never knew the man, remains a fact. But get the difference here, my friends. It doesn't prove you don't love Jesus because you act that way under a particular circumstance. But what does prove that you do not love Jesus is when you give yourself over to that circumstance. That's the reason I put it this way. If Peter's position was, not that he did that dreadful denial under those circumstances, but if he took the position that whenever I'm under pressure, whenever my life is in danger, whenever I'm going to be spoken ill of, if I admit that I'm a follower of the Lamb, Lord Jesus, count me out. I'll follow you when the sailing's good. I'll be with you when it's to my advantage. I don't mind being known as a Christian among Christians. But I'm not going to take it when I'm among people for whom Christian and fundamentalist is a term of derogation and laughter. I have said to seminary students, 
who come to liberal seminaries, such as the one where I taught for many years, basically liberal and so on, I've said to them, you've not only got to be able to handle the intellectual problems, but some of them who are able to deal with the intellectual problems couldn't take the score. As I said, you don't only have to have a certain IQ. If you're a college graduate who can't hand, be an A or a B graduate, don't come to a first-class seminary. God hasn't given you the brains for it. But you need more than that. I know some people who have real brains. But when they are mocked out as conservatives or fundamentalists or Calvinists or anything like that, believers in the Bible, they fold up and die. They're folding up and dying under one circumstance. There's no proof that they're not Christians. But if they make it as a policy of life, that whenever the going gets hard, whenever the pressure is difficult, then I am going to conform to the world and not to Jesus Christ. Let me give you this one specific test for each of you to try on yourself. One of Christ's commandments is this. Love your enemies. He didn't say tolerate them. He says love them. Now pass that through the grid of your own behavior. Do you love them? And are you returning good to those who are doing evil to you? He says if you will not forgive others, God will not forgive you. Is there anybody who has treated you so shamefully and behaves so scandalously that you say about that person at least, Lord, I can't forgive him and I certainly can't think of loving him. Write yourself off as a Christian. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And my commandment is, you put your love. Now people say you can't legislate morals. Jesus Christ must not have read that book. He commands you, love your enemy. That's a mandate from heaven. You're under orders. Don't tell them it's difficult. That's beside the point. When you're dealing with the Lord, the only thing you want to know is, speak, Lord, for thy servant hear it. Whatever he says, you snap to attention. And you follow Jesus Christ outside the camp at whatever cost. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but manes will never hurt me. There are some people who can stand the sticks and stones and die when they're called a name. But there is nothing that can keep you from following and obeying Jesus Christ if you really love him. And that this same Peter, who denied him three times, as you know, was crucified head down. A testimony to the fact that though he did fall on that occasion, he never committed himself, but repented of that and followed Jesus to the end. So, by introspection and by extrospection, you can know whether or not you are a Christian. And if you're a Christian right now, I don't care how young you are, how old you are, if you're a Christian right now, you're going to be a Christian to your dying day. Absolutely sure. Why? No longer depending on you. You're in Christ's hands. And nobody, not even you, can take yourself out of Christ's hands, out of the Father's hands. Oh, you're in it. You're sure. You're safe. Let me conclude my message. I'm sorry, I just a minute or two here. Very hastily, with this sort of objection or problem. As a seventh place, why do some true Christians never have assurance? Reformed Christians, people who know biblical doctrine, who aren't fallen into the error, of Arminianism and such things, but really know the doctrine, nevertheless don't have assurance. Well, some of them, strangely enough, embarrass Pastor Graham or me or anybody like this. They don't know the doctrine. They understand the basic pattern, but they never realize that assurance of salvation was a divine proclamation. And a very, of course, they can't have it. They're like that man hiding in the bushes. You remember, in, where, where was it, Guam or something like that, a Japanese hiding in the bushes six years after the end of the Second World War. Why was he hiding the bushes? He hadn't heard about the fact that there was peace. He didn't realize that, it, that uh, we were no longer the enemies of the Japan, Japanese government. There are people who don't realize. It's very difficult to understand how a reformed person could be ignorant of a point like that, but there are people who don't know 
that assurance is a verity, and so they don't have it. Another is that even though a person be fundamentally sound, understand the biblical doctrine in its reformed way properly, and so on, they can still have erroneous doctrine. Here, as I read, it, erroneous doctrine. Take the, probably the greatest reformed theologian of all time since the Apostle Paul, namely Augustine. Augustine was an opponent of this doctrine. You say, how in the world can a man of that stature make a goof on a doctrine like that? I'll tell you how he made it. He got the idea that assurance of salvation would lead to a cockiness, to an arrogance. And once a person, you could see how he would say that. Look at here, you talked about throwing your hat up in the air and it's all settled and so on. And how a person, you know, I go, well, look at me, I'm in, you see, and so on. He said, as soon as you hold that kind of doctrine, this is going to follow from it, and so on. Now, he knew, of course, arrogance was a sin. There's no such thing as an arrogant, an arrogant saint. If you really are boastful and proud of yourself, you obviously aren't born again. You see, Augustine made the mistake of thinking that the doctrine of assurance of salvation would lead to that, and so he opposed the doctrine. But, of course, it doesn't lead to that. What's your assurance made on? You're in his hand. No one will take it out of his hand. No one will say, where, is it? where do you get your foothold from arrogance? Where is there any room for pride when your whole confidence is based on somebody else? If you're proud, you obviously aren't trusting in Jesus Christ. Well, Augustine goofed at that point. But that explains why he couldn't have the doctrine. He's led a good many others. And the last one is mentioned in the larger catechism. Assurance is intermittent. David had assurance. But in the 51st Psalm, he didn't have assurance. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of my salvation. You suppose that when Peter was denying Jesus Christ, he was assured of his salvation? Can you imagine for a moment that when he looked at Jesus and broke down in tears that he was assured of his salvation? Of course he wasn't. He generally was. At that particular point, he must have asked himself, how could I be a real Christian and do what I've done? It is an intermittent matter. So just because it's an intermittent matter doesn't mean it's not a true doctrine, but you might meet somebody who has a basic assurance of salvation at a time when he has reason to doubt and wonder about it. But the fundamental doctrine, I'm very, very happy to say to you, is that if you have it, you will never lose it. Examine yourself to see whether you have it. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, help us, we pray, by thy divine spirit. Just search the deep things of our soul to know whether indeed what we sing and what we profess and the creed we declare and the Bible we believe and the Christ we proclaim to the world really resides in our souls and we love him intimately and personally and are prepared to live and to die for him. In Jesus' name, amen.